Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. It's Thursday, 3 o'clock. Welcome to Condo Insider. I'm Richard Emery, your host of today's show. Last week we had Sue Savio, and we were talking about the various types of insurance an association has to carry as required by law. It made me think, we've had some notable fires and explosions in the last few days, about what do you do when you have a disaster? What do you do to protect your property? So I decided to invite down to the show today my good friends from Premier Restoration Hawaii to talk about the various problems and challenges you have when you've experienced some form of a disaster. So I want to invite Bob Egbert and um, Brent Bennett here, who's from Premier Restoration Hawaii. Thank you. Yeah, just, thanks for having us. Yeah, tell us a little bit about your company, just so we know who you are. Yeah, um, well, the, the brief bio. So our company, we've been around 16 years. We're a locally owned company. And we started out on Maui. So it was uh, the first 15 years there. And a year ago, we opened up here in Oahu, uh, and it's just been, um, well, we're very appreciative of the welcome that we have received, I should say. So it's kept us busy, <clears throat> but uh, more about the, the type of work that we do, uh, it's, um, we're a full service organization when it comes to uh, disaster response or um, mitigation and restoration. And that includes water, uh, water remediation response, structural drying, um, mold remediation, uh, there's some um, contents management, and these are all things that have a lot of details in them. Um, <clears throat> asbestos abatement, and then of course on the backside, we're a general contractor, and we put it all back together. That's the reconstruction component. Well, when I was looking at your website, I noticed you are proud of the fact you're a part of DKI, I think it is. Tell us who DKI is and what that means to your organization. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, DKI, DKI um, Disaster Cleanup International, it is a group of uh, best-in-class, independent um, restoration companies nationwide. And as an organization, uh, they, that's, they have the largest single footprint nationwide uh, to, to, to respond both locally and to disasters. These cats, they call as they call them, um, hurricanes and whatnot, um, on a large scale. So for us, uh, the benefit of having that relationship uh, is it just it rounds us out so no joke job and there's no job too small no job too large um, here locally uh, for us to handle when it gets to be an event that is of a significant magnitude uh, we need to lean on some friends you simply don't have the resources if there's a huge storm or a hurricane something of that nature uh, our relationship with DKI gives us that kind of um, gives us that kind of resource. And we feel we feel as though, even though the probability and everybody, as they measure it from year to year, you know, the probability of an event of that kind is low. Uh, it's not a matter of if, but when. And it's part of our responsibility to the community to be prepared in a way that's useful. Uh, an offhand question I just thought of, mm -hmm. that we didn't discuss before the show. Sure. But, um, if, for example, you had a apartment in a condominium mm -hmm. and let's say the resident manager died and you have this cleanup after the death because maybe he wasn't found for a couple of days and mm -hmm. there's the issues of health and bodily fluids do you do that kind of work yes you're talking about a biohazard clean cleanup right. and response yes we do so on the unfortunate uh, occurrence when and those things they do happen uh, we we can handle that as well sure so and how many employees do you have we have, uh, as of last week, right around 115 employees. Wow, you're a big company, in Hawaii standards anyway. Well, seven months ago, we had about 52 employees. Uh, there's just, uh, we've, we've had to respond to a number of uh, demands in the marketplace um, uh, in a way that's you know, prompted us to grow in that way. So one of the things I was talking to Sue Savio about last week was that, um, and people don't often understand this. So when you had this start with, I think the most common is a water leak or a water problem, in my opinion anyway. Mm -hmm. I see more of that. Um, 
that you don't want to wait to call the insurance company and file a claim before you do something because the longer you wait, the bigger the damage is potentially. And so you want to call a restoration company right away uh, to deal with that. So if I was to call your company, what kind of service can I expect? Um, you can expect great service. Uh, that's, uh, but what you can expect more than that is someone on the end of the phone. So on the, on the water response side, and you're correct, I mean, even when I look through the in, <laughs> insurance trade journals, which I don't do uh, frequently, but water losses, are they, they lead when it comes to dollar sums. Um, but if somebody has a water loss, they can call us anytime, 24-7. We have, we're staffed 24-7, we have a call center 24-7, and we're gonna be there to, to begin that initial response inside a two hour window on Oahu and Maui. So you're, you're designed for immediate response. We are designed for emergency response, yes, and absolutely. So Unfortunately, it wasn't a nuclear missile response that we were dealing with. You know? yeah. Well, I think uh, I think we were all heading for the culverts on that one. <laughs> yeah, I think I think so. But uh, so I think that's a common misunderstood in the industry, though, is that when you have this claim, whether it be water or wind or whatever it may be, and we'll get into those specifics in a minute, is that you need to take action right away. And your short answer: the reason you take action right away is to mitigate further damage. And that uh, the, the faster that you respond to an incident or an emergency, no matter how slight, the less damage is ultimately, uh, that ultimately happens. So it's a matter of, of money and it's a matter of preserving your property and health and safety. Yeah, and frankly, as uh, Sue was saying, you, you have a legal obligation as a board or an owner to mitigate your damage. You just can't sit there and, sure. and do nothing let the damage get worse and worse. So you have to do something. Mm -hmm. So. Let me ask you this. I, I titled this show Fire, Wind, and Water, and, <laughs> and although um, there are certain some other perils and some things that fire, wind, and water bring to one's attention, mm -hmm. um, let's start with the, the water claim. Give us an example of a kind of a claim you've had and, and, or a situation, how you dealt with it, what you saw the issues were. Yeah, you know, um, for that, I'd like to defer to Brent, and he has, uh, he has a very, uh, intimate knowledge of these claims and, and the work. And the difference between your two as far as what you do for the company are? Yeah. So, is? yeah, for me, primarily it's business development, um, sales and marketing, and things of that nature. Um, although I go out and I get certified and try to keep myself educated. Um, Brent has been with the company for, for a number of years and now is our commercial, uh, our commercial account manager and a little different than residential side. The jobs are usually larger, they're longer jobs, but nonetheless, he has a depth of experience when it comes to um, being that pointy end of the spear and, and responding to those water leads, those water calls in the middle of the night. And so he's, your marketing, and he's the guy that has to live up to all the promises you made. <laughs> he does, but I only promise what he can deliver. Okay. <laughs> so talk about water. Give us an example of a claim and how, how you dealt with it, and you know, without getting too specific, but give us right. a general explanation. Uh, yeah, without sharing any property names or anything like that. Uh, fire sprinkler break in a hotel, or um, you know, obviously the damage is there. The longer you sit and wait, um, the more damage is going to occur. So call whether it's in the middle of the night or during the day, uh, respond as fast as you can. Um, get the water sucked up, get the property dried out, and um, you're avoiding probably your next question of the mold issue at that point um, by responding quickly. Um, uh, sewer backups, especially in Waikiki, is a huge, huge problem uh, with the sewer systems and stuff. So, um, obviously. So, when you say you do that, and without getting very specific, <clears throat> You said you water clean up and drying. So kind of elaborate that a little bit more. What's involved in when you have that fire sprinkler system that breaks? Uh, well, the first thing is getting standing water off the ground. I mean, that's first and foremost. And then to salvage anything that can be saved, uh, you know, framing of the building or uh, building materials that aren't necessarily destroyed by the water. Um, get those dried out back to a dry standard, as they call it, a normal moisture content. Um, and then, you, you know, you're good for repairs at that point. Depending on the category of water, then you, like you get into sewage loss and stuff like that, contaminated water, you're basically removing anything that got wet. 
And so I assume that one of the issues, potential issues, is if you don't do that, is is what we call mold, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And everybody gets, for some reason, they get the fear of mold. But my understanding is there's lots of molds, and some of them are toxic, and some of them are not. Is can you describe that a little bit more for us? There's there's not really a mold that's good for you. Is uh, I guess the fast answer to that. Um, but there's mold everywhere, so um, you're never going to get rid of it. It's part of nature, you know, you're always going to have mold spores in the air, um, but there's a, there's a tolerance that humans should be around, basically is the, the easy answer for that. Um, so we try to keep it at that normal, you know, doing mold remediation projects and stuff like that. So get it safe to inhabit the building and property. So, so if you had mold, what, are there any special precautions you have to take to remove mold or is it pretty much a, a sponge and Clorox? <laughs> uh, you, you don't want to use Clorox. Um, you know, being water-based, you actually probably add to the problem more than fix it. Um, and with mold, you, you're not trying to kill it. Um, mold is, is dangerous for a human, whether it's dead or alive. Um, it's the spores you're breathing in. So um, the way to clean is, is you clean it. You, you get rid of it, remove it from wherever you're trying to remediate. So whether you kill it or not, that's not the, the correct way. And so how do you get rid of it? What do you do? HEPA vacuum, we have equipment, uh, air scrubbers and stuff like that. Uh, you want to contain off the area so you're, you're not cross-contaminating potentially unaffected areas of the house or property. Um, and, but HEPA equipment is, is the way to remove it. Now under normal <coughs> circumstances, do, does that person removing it have to wear any protective gear or is it just pretty much not that dangerous? That, the vacuum with the filter will do the job. Uh, you definitely want to wear PPE, uh, respirators and, and suits, and gloves, and um, eye protection, you know, depending on the degree of demolition or removal that you're doing. Um, but, you, you know, you're almost making it worse, like you just said, with the vacuum cleaner, trying to clean it up yourself. Without the proper equipment, you're, you're probably making it worse, whether it looks like it or not. You're probably making the situation worse by cross-contaminating. So it's feasible if you tried to do it yourself and you thought you cleaned it up, you really left all the spores there, and you may still have a biohazard anyway because mm -hmm. it wasn't properly contained and cleaned up and yeah. vacuumed away. Is that correct? kind of yeah. what I'm hearing yeah, you yeah. say? You can't, you can't really see if you clean the air. Uh, mold spores are something the human eye is not going to be able to detect. So uh, trying, to, trying to clean something you can't see basically is, is difficult. So. Now, do you agree that most of the claims you see are water claims? By volume, um, by volume, most of the claims that we see are water. So yeah. if you had this one apartment that had a major water break, <coughs> the ice maker broke, and there's water all over the place, and, but still contained within the one apartment, mm -hmm. it probably makes sense for them to call a restoration company like yourself to, to properly clean it up, and it would be, theoretically, if they had the right insurance policies, be covered by insurance. Yes. Absolutely. It makes sense to call. It's that simple. I mean, with uh, the extraction, as Brent was saying, extraction of the water uh, as a first step, it's the drying component. You want to make sure that the materials are dry. You know, mold grows where there's water, where there's food, and where there's a spore. So, so if an owner calls you and you're responding immediately and you're getting somebody in within two hours, um, are you working with them? Because maybe they don't have their credit card handy right that moment. I mean, and you know it's gonna be paid by insurance. I mean. Yeah, uh, if, they, if they have insurance, insurance generally covers this. Um, you've got a broken washer line in your home or something like that. <clears throat> um, it, you can call us, we can respond. We, we can respond before the claim is even filed. Insurance companies will, will reimburse for that work for that emergency work. Uh, we do it all the time. We've got great relationships with the insurance companies and it's, not, it's usually not a problem. We're not gonna tell you no if you don't have a credit card on hand when you call us. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, I mean, yeah. People, no, you know, people are afraid to call sometimes. <clears throat> oh, I didn't get my paycheck till Friday and mm -hmm. what am I gonna do? And, and my experience is that uh, I haven't come across forever an issue where in, a, in the condo or an association well, they didn't have insurance, it's required by law. And that they're better off t yeah. calling right away and, and yeah. mitigating the problem than uh, not mitigating the problem. You're, you're, you're better off to call early. Call early, respond fast, there's gonna be less damage, less cost. Yeah. We do, I mean, we run into, uh, well, we see everything just because of the volume of, of work that we do. Uh, we run into homeowners that uh, aren't insured. 
And so that's a whole other conversation. My last comment before we take a break was I remember a project of ours that they had a gas leak and the gas leak was significant. It could have blow up the building. And so we went ahead and got a plumber right away to turn the gas off. Mm -hmm. It's just, that was really only damage, the leak of the gas. Mm -hmm. I remember the board saying to me, did you get three bids? <laughs> to turn, to turn the I gas said, off? No, look at our contract. <laughs> we have the right to make decisions to protect life and safety. And uh, obviously, it's probably more important to turn the gas off sooner than later than it is to go get three bids, particularly when it's covered by insurance. Absolutely. Yeah. I would support that. So now that last little comment before we go back into wind and fire and smoke and the rest of it, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in one minute. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on ThinkTech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you keeping you safe. Aloha. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're sitting here talking to Bob and Brent from <coughs> Premier Restoration Hawaii about what do you do when you have a disaster and the importance of taking action right away. We discussed a little bit about uh, water damage and mold, and we're going to get into wind, and we talk about wind and fire and asbestos, so uh, we have a short show, so let's get right into uh, the wind, and we're not talking about my hot air, we're talking about <laughs> the wind from a, either a high wind storm or a hurricane, so, so what do you do in a case like that? What are, what are the typical problems you encounter with the wind? Uh, roofing. Um, this is the main thing, roofing and then an intrusion from, usually you got wind, you got rain. Um, it's a lot of issues. Trees blown over, hitting people's houses or property. And um, it's usually the wind leads to water intrusion most of the time, is what we see. So, or board ups, you know, broken windows and stuff we've dealt with. We can do board ups on um, basically to secure property. And mm -hmm. your roof blows off, you don't want a hole in your roof, even if it's not raining. So. And the goal is to keep the water out and minimize further damage. I mean, that, yeah. that's really I know that I was on Kauai in 1992 with Hurricane Aniki, and uh, uh, there's always so much you can do, but preventing future <clears throat> water penetration because right. you've got the thing buttoned up as best you can mm -hmm. is an important factor. And of course, after a major hurricane, uh, you may be talking months before you can right. actually make the final repair right. with yeah. regard to a building. but. You want to try to maintain its livability to a degree because there's no place else to go. Yeah. Uh, but you know, a lot of people don't understand that it doesn't have to be a hurricane. There's wind storms that are just wind yep. that create these kind of problems. Yep. Yeah. And we we see roofs that get peeled up uh, frequently, and uh, we get the call in the middle of the night, and uh, we go out. We'll respond and we'll do the emergency board up. Uh, we'll do it after a fire even. Uh, the, you know, the firemen have other things to do. Right. They could clean up their gear and get ready to respond to the next call and leave it to companies like ours to secure the area and uh, make it safe and clean. Well, fire has been on everybody's mind recently because mm -hmm. of Marco Polo. I'm yeah. sure you've heard of that. Absolutely. Are you doing any work at Marco Polo? Uh, yes, we are. A, a so what, what are you doing? Amount. Well, we've done, um, right now, it's all asbestos abatement. And uh, you know, prior to the abatement, and especially initially after the fire, uh, we did that initial mitigation. There was just a, a huge amount of water in the building from fighting the fire, water below the, the source units, and smoke uh, above. So that that was um, that was how it all started. At this point, uh, it's cleaning up that asbestos. And we hear the word asbestos all the time. Tell us 
why that's a health hazard or what the issue is on asbestos and particularly about who can remove asbestos? I mean, it's not just anybody off the street. Yeah, it, uh, asbestos is, uh, and so you're lucky you caught me just as I finished my asbestos training. So uh, they have just enough knowledge to be dangerous. But asbestos, um, you know, it causes asbestosis. Uh, there was really, you know, patterns that the government had found years ago based upon really shipyard works and things like that, pipe coverings. But um, <clears throat> once they learned that asbestos was, um, you know, um, a hazardous material, it started to become regulated. And that was 80 or 86, so, so it's been some time. And essentially, it's in building materials, flooring, uh, joint compounds, roof tiles, things like that. And <clears throat> when it's intact, it's not a problem. But when it's disturbed, uh, like in a fire, or if you start to cut it, or if you sand it or scrape it, those little, those particulates, the crystals, they become, it's, it, it's friable material, they call it. It's airborne. And that's when you start to breathe it in, when you can. So that is what created the regulatory environment around handling asbestos, is, is really a matter of health and safety. And what is the requirement now to handle asbestos? What do you have to do? Yeah, it's, uh, it's significant. With, um, <clears throat> you've got to, what normally happens if we go to an asbestos job where there's a, a job that re is an abatement job, we'll bring a third party consultant in, an environmental consultant. They'll assess it, they'll, they'll do a survey and provide information about what is present and what the scope of work is and the rules of the road, what needs to happen. All of our work resides within there. So we'll put up containment, much as when Brent was talking about the mold. Um, you'll have negative air pressure inside containment. The guys wear the PPE, the suits, the respirators. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty stringent, uh, from a cleanliness standpoint, it's pretty stringent. You have to be cleared you, when it's all done. You need to be a certified abatement technician and supervisor to even be on site in any of those projects. So. Mm -hmm. Is it my understanding, too, that if you didn't have those certifications, that you may be subject to big fines and problems oh, yeah. with government, you know, on enforcement because <coughs> of EPA and all this, uh, EPA, but... Yep. Um, Anything other than, if you're a homeowner and you want to work in your own home and you know it's, as, as, it's asbestos containing materials, um, you have the right to do that. Anything other than that is regulated. And yeah, you, the Department of Health takes it very seriously. But if you were in your own home, would you recommend them doing it themselves? I would, but that all depends on you know if how concerned you are about your own health. You put yourself at risk and the risk of getting in trouble with fines and stuff if you don't dispose of it properly. And, and so it's not just the removal; it's what you do with it after it's correct. removed. Correct. You leave it in your living room for the next 20 years, then that's that's your <laughs> issue. But uh, you're going to have to get rid of it, and there's ways that that needs to be done. Yeah, the whole chain of custody. How about lead paint? Is that an issue for you guys? Or? Yeah, lead paint is an issue. Is that was an issue at Marco Polo too, right, or not? <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I don't know, I, uh, specifically. I wouldn't be surprised if it was. And what do you do on lead paint issues? Is it a matter of just painting over it, or is it, what is the issue on lead paint? Well, you could paint over lead paint uh, if, you, if you chose to do that. Uh, if you're doing a renovation and you're going to disturb that material, just like the asbestos, you run into the same scenario. It's a regulated material, and you have to treat it as such. So if you're taking out a piece of drywall that's got lead paint on it, you would have to yeah. well, if take there's, action? There's a, there is a provision in the law. If it's a small enough you know, patch, then you can, you can remove it. But there are still um, certifications that come with that. Uh, you'd want to, us as an asbestos abatement contractor, we can remove a little bit of um, you know, lead-based paint you know, from the wall or a sectional wall. The specifics, I'd have to check with our abatement manager on that. So going back to you, Brent, take a fire. Mm -hmm. And let's forget about Marco Polo for a second. What do you do when you have a fire? What, do you, what, do you, what are the basic steps? What are the things you look at? What do you do? Uh, well, creating a, a secure building is probably the first step. You know, a lot of burglaries, a lot of crime around those <coughs> scenes. Unfortunately, there's people that target you know, those areas when they see it on the news, you know, it's an easy break in, there's no one there. Uh, so securing the building is number one. Um, preventing any further damage, whether that's water from the fire department or, um, you know, any hazards that could be inside the home, hanging building materials and stuff like that. Um, and after all that, you're, you're starting to clean up. 
So you're removing the source of the fire to charred materials or burnt drywall or whatever it may be, uh, and then start the cleaning process. HEPA vacuum again, like mold, um, wiping with different different chemicals to get the smoke odor and the fire grease and stuff off the walls, floor, whatever it may be. Because I know that uh, in a lot of the big fires, when there's potential insurance claims and defendants, <coughs> you're able to do your initial remediation and mitigation, as you call, without having to wait for some insurance company to, or some defense lawyer to come and say, no, you can't disturb this. You can do your initial mitigation without you, too much. You don't want to disturb look. the scene ever, uh, and that's a problem. Uh, some sometimes arises that you know people want you to get in there and, and react right away, but <coughs> fortunately, uh, like a fire investigator, the fire department hasn't released the scene yet. Yeah, uh, you don't want to touch it, um, especially you know if someone loses a life or uh, potentially you could jeopardize that insurance claim, so their claim is denied if you're if you're moving stuff around or you know stuff like that. And who makes the decision whether someone can go back in and occupy the space? To take, occupy the space right. would be ultimately between us and insurance and the homeowner, you know, until they're satisfied with the property. So if it was structurally damaged, would, is it possible the city or someone would say, no, this, we're condemning this space? And you, we, we hire engineers to come in and take a look at, like, structural engineers mm -hmm. if it's, if it's jeopard, jeopardized the framing or, you know, the structure of the building. Um, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes it's a kitchen fire and you got burnt drywall. That's an easy one. But uh, there's been some jobs, like again, not naming any names, that we've had to bring in those structural guys to, to clear it, basically. So. Well, we're at the end of our show, and I guess the, the summary of this would be when you have a fire, wind, rain, storm, whatever it may be, uh, you should call an expert to assist you and take prompt action right away to mitigate the problem and using professionals because of all the environmental and hazardous type issues that may surface and try to do it yourself may not be a good idea. And certainly for an association, you're covered by insurance and you should take that. So I want to thank both of you for being here today. It's very insightful for our viewers. And I want to thank all of our viewers for watching Condo Insider. Hawaii's show about association living. Let's remember that about 38% of our population lives in an association, and we hope you find our show informational and useful. Aloha.